Awesome. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we'll get going, I guess. Um, oh, if I can get this to cooperate. Here we go. So who are we? Uh, my name's Ian George. Uh, I'm a molecular microbiologist at OSP Microcheck. I'm an iGEM alum. I was on the iGEM Calgary team in 2012 and 2013. I've been a judge in the past and I have a PhD from the University of Calgary. And I'm Zonja Billebeck. I'm zooming in from the University of Groningen today where I am an assistant professor and I started my iGEM career in 2010 at with a team at ETH in Zurich where I participated by myself and then I kind of like throughout my career I worked together with the Columbia team and also here with the uni Groningen team and I'm part of the measurement committee since 2019. Cool. So today we're here to talk a bit about Gibson and yeast assembly. So I'm going to kick it off with just some basics of assembly. Um, so first off, you may have seen this slide before I stole it from one of our previous measurement presentations, but really uh, what we're talking about here is making recombinant DNA. So mole uh, DNA molecules where we're using genetic recombination to take genetic material from multiple sources and create sequences that would not otherwise be found in the genome. This is useful because it lets us make unique and interesting things. Um, so, but before we kind of jump into this, when you can order the entire sequence from somebody like Twist, GenScript, or IDT, why would you even want to bother with assembling sequences? If you can just get somebody else to do all of this hard work, what's the point? Well, there's a couple different reasons why you may want to do this. For one, you may want to express the same gene with different promoters or tag it differently. Frankly, it can be cheaper or easier just to do the assembly of that stage yourself after you've gotten the bulk of the gene synthesized. For very long sequences, uh, it can actually be quite challenging to get them synthesized in one go. Uh, in many cases, it might actually be faster or just easier to order smaller pieces and do the assembly yourself. Um, and sometimes you wanna put this into multiple different plasmids. Uh, again, that can be a cost thing, it can be a time thing where it may be easier just to do that assembly yourself. So as far as the overview of assemblies go, we have BioBrick assembly, uses restriction sites and all that jazz. It's basically the ancient way of doing assembly. Um, but there's a couple other methodologies. Gibson assembly, which we're going to talk about today, uses an exonuclease to create large overhangs and uh, work on homology to actually get your assembly to work. And another one is Golden Gate, which we're not going to talk about today, but uses some similar concepts here. So Gibson assembly. It's a method for assembling multiple linear fragments of DNA in a one pot isothermal reaction. It was developed in about the late 2000s. Um, you can see a lovely little image of Daniel Gibson over there on the right. Uh, it relies on complementary overhangs at the ends of each of these sequences, enabling multiple fragments to be assembled in one go. It's really handy because you don't have to rely on specific restriction enzyme cut sites. You don't have to worry about cut site or scar sites, and you can avoid some of the challenges with cut site incompatibilities with this guy. So the over, overall process of going about Gibson assembly, first you have to actually identify your sequences and design primers to ensure you're gonna get that overlap. Once you've been able to do that, you need to make these fragments. You can do that by PCR or you can use DNA synthesis. And once you actually get those fragments that you're actually interested in using, you're gonna to have to perform this Gibson reaction. And this one pot has three different enzymes that are gonna function in there. You have a T5 exonuclease. So that's gonna chew back the ends of your fragments that you've made. Um, you have a DNA polymerase. Uh, that is going to act after those chewed back pieces have started to anneal together and fill in the gaps. And then you're going to have a DNA ligase that's going to glue it all together and give you a nice covalently linked strand, ideally, fingers crossed. Um, so ultimately, hopefully we end up with a lovely little plasmid in this case. So now that we've kind of gone over the 
overview of how exactly you're gonna do this, I'm gonna go through a bit of an example using a yeast gene that I played around with in my PhD. So in my PhD, I was interested in a stress gene. Uh, I wanted to attach a fluorescent protein to it. In this case, Red Star 2, it's basically just a variant of RFP. And the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to be able to localize where the heck this protein actually was being expressed, especially when we put it under stress conditions. So the first thing we have to do is go about and actually get the sequence for that guy. Um, from this and my research, there's lots of databases out there, but for S Palmby, which was the organism I was working in, you can go to Palmbase, you can pull down all the annotation information, get the sequences that you need. Uh, I like to use a tool called Benchling. Um, there are plenty of other tools that you can use to do this, um, but that's just the one I gravitate towards and you can throw all those sequences in there together. So first thing I did is I went and got the DCP1 gene from Palmbase. So we can see that guy here just represented as a, as a little uh, gene fragment. Uh, I have a destination plasmid, so something I'm going to put it into. This one's very handy because it actually has all the promoters and terminators and uh, antibiotic resistance cassettes and all that stuff in there. And then last but not least, I have uh, Red Star 2, which was on a plasmid. It was just something convenient in the lab so that we could amplify it. You could just as easily have gone and grabbed this sequence from somewhere else and amplified out of it. So the first thing we have to do is design some primers if we're gonna go about the PCR methodology for this. So we need overhanging primers. So basically you've got your primer that latches on to each of those different pieces of the fragments you care about. And then a little piece that fits off the end that is our actual uh, piece that's gonna give us our complementarity between these different sequences. So, these are really, really important because they are what are going to give our, our complementarity that place for it to anneal in the Gibson reaction to work its magic. So we can do this in Benchling. It has a tool called the Assembly Wizard. It is great for a first pass, but you do definitely need to do some follow up on it. So I'm going to go through a little video that I put together and I'm going to annotate this, okay? So ideally this guy works. All right, so first thing first, down at the bottom right, you're gonna click create new assembly and you're gonna click Gibson. Then you're gonna press start. And this is gonna bring up a big thing at the bottom here where you're gonna be able to pick your backbone, so your plasmid. So right now I'm going through and I'm selecting the entire plasmid and just kind of aligning it correctly with the multiple cloning site. I wanna retain some of these restriction enzyme sites, but you could just as easily have done it without retaining them. Now I'm gonna click insert and I'm gonna to go to my DCP1 gene and I'm gonna select the coding region for that guy. The most important part here, cause I'm tagging it, is not to include the stop codon because if you do, you will prematurely stop your protein and sadness. Next, I'm gonna to go to this other Red Star 2 plasma and I'm gonna attach the linker and the Red Star CDS, including the terminator. Now, once that's done, I'm just gonna give it a name something that makes sense and press assemble. And by doing this, I've already preset this so it's gonna store the sequence and the primers that it's gonna generate. It's gonna go ahead and put together our sequence that I'm actually interested in. It's going to have made the six primers in this case that you need to perform this Gibson reaction. And it's gonna give you a whole in silico predicted uh, look at what your assembled plasmid should look like. All right, I know I went a little fast there. All right, so, ah, there we go, tried to play again. So Benchling provides us with an in silico pre-run. Basically it gives us a chance to just test this in the computer to see what it's actually gonna look like. It'll create our primers that we can use for PCR. Now, the one thing I would caveat here is you will need to double check these primers afterwards for melting temps and GC content. Um, it can be a little complicated because you have the overhang, so it only calculates it based off of the part that's gonna anneal to your specific piece for your melting temp. But your uh, overhang pieces, you really wanna watch out that you're kinda in that space of having 40 to 60% GC content. Um, and at most your primers, you don't really want them to be more than three degrees 
apart from a temperature perspective. Uh, complementary regions should be somewhere in the like as low as 18, but like 18 to 40 base pairs long. And this is just really important so that you get good annealing going on here. So once we've made those primers and we've vetted them and we've made sure that they're good to go, we can either we can go either go ahead and order them, pr proceed to PCR or whichever process we're going to go next. So alternatively, you can go the create PCR product in Benchling, and this will create the entire fragment, including those overhangs, and you could just send that to DNA synthesis if you want to go that path as well, or if you don't have a template that you can use to actually amplify that off in your lab. So just going over this a little bit over it again, um, we can produce fragments by synthesis or PCR. So we use our overhangs, we do our PCR, we get our fragments, and we perform a PCR cleanup and band confirmation. After that, we're now pretty much at the stage where we can go ahead and we can do our Gibson reaction. So as I alluded to before, the first thing we have to, the first thing that's gonna happen in our Gibson master mix is our T5 exonuclease is gonna act on these fragments and it's gonna chew back the three prime end, exposing, uh, or it's gonna chew back the five prime end, exposing a three prime overhang. After that happens, those overhangs will anneal together and our DNA polymerase will come in and try and fill in the gaps. You notice that it's chewing back not only our overhang, but a bit of our actual like original sequence that we cared about as well. Lastly, we'll get our DNA ligase to come in and it'll glue it all together and we end up with our fully assembled plasmid. So once we finish that off, um, in this case, uh, this was designed such that it had uh, pieces that you can grow it up and include it in an E. coli back strain. So we'll transform it into there. We can make lots and lots of copies of this, run a mini prep, and make sure that we've got lots and lots of copies of DNA to move forward with. Once that's done, um, it's really, really important that we confirm that our assembled fragment actually is what our confirmed fragment should be. So you can do that by colony PCR and gel as you would have done in the E. coli. And I would highly recommend this using Sanger sequencing to make sure that you don't have missense or nonsense mutations. They're rare, but they do happen. And the worst thing that you want is you develop this whole thing and you end up with an indel, an insertion or deletion, and it messes up your entire protein, and all that work is for naught, and you have to go back to the start. The cost of Sanger sequencing is generally pretty low now, so with some primers and that, you can go ahead and confirm it and just make sure that everything is working. It's just worth getting in the habit of going about doing. And that pretty much comes to the end there. I've included a couple of resources here. So Benchling is what I used. Uh, AdGene and BioCat had some good documentation just around how to do Gibson. Uh, that second one, the BioCat one, is actually really good because it has a lot of troubleshooting steps and that kind of thing if it's not working for you. And if you don't want to use Benchling, another tool you can use is the NEB Builder. Um, it has a whole mechanism for doing Gibson assembly. It's a little bit wonky though, so you may have to follow some of their videos they have to get it working. Cool. I know I went kind of quickly, but uh, anybody have any questions that we can take now before we jump on to the next section? I only had a question here about the recording. So I think right after the, um, the webinar is finished, you know, give it a little bit of time, but then all the presentations will be up and also all the previous presentations have been up on the link that I just posted in the chat. So if you want to go back to and kind of like go through the whole webinar series where we have webinars on, you know, how to start your project. Also a lot of resources on modeling are up there now. Um, feel free, go back and uh, watch it again. Um, then other questions are, why do you have to worry about the GC content and melting temperature? Cole is asking that. Good question. Um, if you have too high of a GC content, you can get it 
such that you're not going to get those uh, those overhangs. They're, they're going to get secondary structure, and they're going to have other challenges becoming or getting totally melted. So you won't get good annealing with your other fragments. Um, that's also why the melting temperature kind of plays into that as well. Then there's another question. Is Benchling a free software? Yes, it is. Yes, for iGEM teams, it is 100% free. There are more advanced features if you turn into a company that you can start to pay for with it. Yeah. Then uh, Daniel is asking, how many parts can be assembled in one pot using Gibson assembly? And if there is a limit? Typically with Gibson, you don't want to go above like four to six fragments. When you get well above that, it just it doesn't work as well. It's not as efficient. Um, there are other tools kind of like Golden Gate that can work better for that. Yeah, and I also gonna uh, we, we gonna continue with yeast assembly and actually one of the advantages of yeast assembly is that you can, it gets more efficient when you assemble many pieces and efficient just means you know, you do 10 colony PCR, you, you have colonies after your reaction, you had you do 10 colony PCRs, how many of those actually do have the correct insert and also no mutation. So you significantly find more um, if you do yeast assembly. So as we, there's another one, after joining two parts together, let's say A and B, could you add C between A and B in the next step? Um, I can answer, so yes, you can, if you have inserted, for example, a restriction site. So if you have inserted a restriction site between A and B, you can cut the plasmid and insert C in the middle with um, designed to have uh, homology regions to the, 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 ends of the, the end of A and the beginning of B. You could also generate a, a new plasmid backbone, so to say, where you then just amplify the plasmid already containing A and B. Again, just making sure that C has homology ends to the end of A and the beginning of B. So this is in a way how you can go about it. So each plasmid can always be treated as a fragment. So if you, you know, either it's original plasmid or it's a plasmid already containing components in it, you can always treat it as one of the fragments, so to say. Okay, uh, then there's one question. Is there an upper limit of DNA assembled using Gibsons? Let's say is up to 20 KB possible? Yes, quite large fragments can be assembled. If I recall, I think they were doing this to assemble a genome in the past when they developed Gibson, so. Yeah, so in my own experience, though, you need to um, work with, like, say, like special strains, which are actually compatible with like very large um, plasmids, especially E. coli. So certainly there's differences in strains um, being able to take up that large plasmids. So in my experience, the smaller the, 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 the final assembly, the better it works. But you can push it pretty far. Let's put it like this. Um, okay, then there's another question. Uh, how many different Homo sapiens genes can be added into the yeast genome through Gibson assembly? Um, to answer that, so adding anything into the genome is usually not feasible with Gibson assembly. So Gibson assembly is a, a method to assemble plasmids, so extra chromosomal DNA into a, a plasmid. So if you want to add any, anything into the genome, these days you would use CRISPR-Cas, if that answers the question. So Gibson assembly is really for in vitro assembly of plasmids, not for genome engineering. <laughs> 